I will uh, uh, sort of broadly divide uh, this talk in, uh, in four parts. So I will first talk about whether we should uh, sort of use a concept of inequality based on uh, what economists uh, like to think about, which is utility functions, that is based on uh, consumption and leisure, I should also say, or, or income. Then uh, I will try to, to link the two, the two concepts. The two concepts are related to each other. And uh, I will make uh, some brief uh, you know, um, reference to some more theoretical uh, developments. And then I will talk about the transmission mechanism from uh, consumption, from income inequality to uh, consumption inequality, which is uh, the concept of the marginal propensity to consume, which is a concept that economists uh, have used for, uh, for many years. How much does consumption change when there is a shock to income? And I will stress the fact that it is important to account for heterogeneity in the response, and in particular for the fact that the poor tend to respond more to income shocks and change consumption more uh, than, uh, than the rich. And this has implication for fiscal policy, for fiscal redistribution, which at these times in Europe is important because apparently monetary policy has been used a lot during the crisis with quantitative easing uh, and so forth. So the only thing that is left many people think is fiscal policy and the fact that fiscal policy can affect different, different groups of people, have social impact, uh, is important. And this ties to, uh, uh, directly to inequality. And finally, if I have time, uh, I will talk about some more recent uh, development which have to do with measurement problems, uh, new surveys on consumption that people are using, and problems also with what I've said in the first part, which has been challenged by uh, by recent uh, by recent research, so let me sort of um, start by saying that what really uh, economists uh, think about when they think about well-being is uh, utility, and utility uh, depends on uh, uh, on consumption. So the first uh, thing that one would say is that one should measure really well-being and differences in well-being by uh, consumption rather than income, but. As you know, most of the debate about inequality is based on income inequality. So when we think about people being poor or rich, they, this is generally measured in terms of um, income uh, and sometimes some parts of wealth, for instance, real estate, whether they are homeowners or not, not so much on uh, consumption. There are reasons uh, uh, for that, but there are also good reasons for choosing consumption. Income can be a misleading indicator uh, of well-being because sometimes people are poor but they are temporarily poor, they are not permanently uh, poor, while instead consumption should reflect long-term uh, prospects better than, uh, than income. Another reason is that there are uh, differences in consumption that derive from the accumulation of income, that derive from the accumulation of assets. Some people can borrow. So, the, or then people uh, will save so that when income changes, people are able to buffer these income fluctuations and maintain a constant uh, standard uh, uh, of living. On returns to wealth can differ across different people. Then there are in-kind transfers, for instance, in, uh, in some countries, for instance, in my countries, in-kind transfers or, or inter vivos transfers are important between I mean, it's in various forms. Co-residence, for instance, is, uh, is one form. There are transfers from the government, there are transfers from other families, and income very often does not reflect these transfers, while consumption instead uh, does. And then, as you know, durables are purchased infrequently, so we don't really replace a car every year, or we don't buy a refrigerator every year, but we buy it infrequently, so some... Sometimes uh, consumption reflects the services that we receive from these uh, durables, but income instead does not reflect the purchase uh, of these durables. So there are a variety of reasons why one should focus on, one should prefer uh, consumption rather than income inequality uh, or consumption measure rather than income measures. Just to sum up, there are a variety of reasons why we should uh, sometimes focus on consumption rather than income. And I will, without going into much detail, show you now some data. This data refer to, to my country. 
And the way they are constructed is not really important, but what is important is that there are two lines. The yellow line uh, is a consumption, uh, some measure of consumption inequality. Here is a standard measure of dispersion the variance. Then there is the Gini index. Then there is inequality at the top and the bottom measured in various ways. But generally what you see from this picture is that the green line is above the other line. The other line is the yellow line. So if you measure inequality by income, you get a bigger number, well, you know, regardless of how you measure it. And this is the first fact that you can see here. And the second fact that you can see here is that broadly there is an increase in income inequality. And this is what people refer often as being increased inequality in many societies. There, I will show you now, you know, next a picture on Germany, the US, but there is sort of a trend of increasing income inequality, but there is also an increase in consumption inequality, but you see less than that. So broadly, what we can get from this picture is that, that there is increase in income inequality, that there is increase in consumption inequality, but consumption inequality increases a bit less. And one of the things I want to focus on is why there is these differences in, in sort of these, uh, uh, these trends. This picture is sort of a similar picture, and the reason I'm focusing on these countries is because data are uh, harmonized and I could give you sort of details if you write me on the sources of this. And so you see that, you know, the blue line is again income inequality and this income inequality is much larger than uh, consumption inequality. In this case, it is the United States. And the same for the Gini coefficient, which is another measure, measure of dispersion. And the same for the so-called inequality at the bottom, which is the ratio of the median to the 10th uh, percentile. And this is the so-called inequality at the top. So regardless of how we measure inequality, you see that the blue line is always above, you know, in this case, the, the red line. And that there is an increase in both, but apparently the red line increases a bit less. And here is a third uh, example. Uh, here there are sort of fewer data points, but also for Germany you have a similar picture. And if you construct, you know, in some harmonized way, uh, measures for Spain or France or the major European countries, you see uh, something like this. And also for many countries from the, you know, from Soviet Union, from from Eastern from Eastern Europe. So now I would sort of summarize this evidence, which comes from many studies saying that income inequality tends to dominate consumption inequality, and we should sort of try to understand why this is so. The second thing is that this is sort of true regardless of how we measure income inequality and how we measure consumption inequality, variance, gene, and so forth. There is an increase in both income and consumption inequality over the years, and also after the, uh, the crisis, but there is more for income inequality. And then there are also considerable differences across countries. Today, we we'll have the time to focus on the differences between the US, Italy, Germany, and many other countries. But institutions are, of course, uh, important for this transmission uh, uh, mechanism. So the, the question that we want now to ask is the following. Is there any link between income and consumption inequality? And if we can find this link, what is the transmission mechanism from income or other resources that households might have and consumption inequality, and then sort of we go uh, down, uh, down the line. So if you think about what can happen to an individual or a household, um, in terms of his or her resources, income, wealth, and uh, consumption are subject to considerable variation from year to year. If any one of you has been involved in collecting survey data or say panel data, so surveys that are repeated for the same individual over time, we'll notice that there is a lot of noise or there are a lot of changes from one year to the next. So some of that may reflects measurement error because people don't report some amount of assets or some income, but other you know, differences reflect what can happen over the year. So what are the sources of these changes? I will sort of group them in three, in three parts. There is, uh, of course, labor market risk. So over, say, the year, some people become unemployed. And this is what the labor economists usually think of as a transitory shock, because 
not always, not in all countries, not in all years, but after, say, an unemployment spell, at some point, people will sort of revert, find a new job. So we would consider this as a transitory shock over one's uh, life. Then there are more, some more permanent shocks. So it can happen that during the year, there is some productivity shock. For instance, you or someone uh, becomes disabled, cannot work anymore. So this is what we can call sort of health-related uh, uh, health uh, risk, which should go into affect your productivity. There could be the change in some skill prices, for instance, due to technology. People who are now working, say, in the big data sector or industry are in high demand relative to more sort of traditional uh, jobs. And this is uh, something that uh, has to do with, say, uh, technology. Uh, there could be some effect from international trade, the opening uh, from, uh, uh, you know, to, to China, which has changed the relative prices, but perhaps in the industry where you are working, there are shocks that are firm-related, your firm closes and so forth. So all these things happen in the labor market, but then there is also asset market risk, so not in Europe in recent period, but in other countries there can be inflation risk, there can be fluctuations in, in stock and bond market prices, there can be fluctuations in local housing prices. I heard yesterday that in Luxembourg there is a sort of a housing boom and prices are going up. So uh, people who have bought a house maybe two or three years ago are happy, and those who instead rent are unhappy, and so forth. And then there is a third, and then there is a third sort of item here, um, through which income, wealth, and consumption will change every year, and the reflex choices. So it can happen that over the year you uh, you take a leave for your choice, so you work a bit less. It could be that over the year you retire. It could be that over the year you undertake some human capital accumulation or some investment in human capital which requires resources. Could, there could be a portfolio reallocation, changing. Everything that you do that reflects uh, choices will also affect your, uh, your, your resources. So how should we, in a very sort of rough way, think about the things that can happen to your resources. So here I have a very sort of uh, simple expression for what can happen to income Y of individual I in a given year T, uh, which can reflect either permanent effects, so for instance the uh, health-related uh, uh, problems that I was explaining uh, before, or it can reflect some temporary shock. So P is the permanent component of income, and epsilon is the transitory component of income. And many labor economists nowadays, for the past 20 years, think about labor income and the labor income process, or how it changes every year, as you know, composed of two of these two components, a more permanent component and a more transitory component. So if this is true, and neglecting other complications, then the inequality in income, which is this bar of Y or some other measure of dispersion of income, will reflect the variance of the permanent component and the variance of the you know, more transitory component. So people will differ because of these permanent effects or because of this transitory uh, effect. So what um, we can see is that if we see some increase in income inequality, now, looking at or thinking back about the figures that I presented before, if you see some increase in income inequality, then the question is how much comes from changes in the permanent component? Are people more unequal today because they are permanently different? Or are the people more unequal today because they are sort of transitory different? And for many years, labor economists have agreed that, you know, mostly, is because you know there is this permanent component that is changing, but also a transitory component is very important. Maybe one third or maybe even half of the differences in income is transitory, and the typical example is unemployment. So you are unemployed this year, and therefore your income is low, but next year you find a job, and so you revert 
to your, your previous path, while other changes instead are more permanent. Now, we want to link this change in income inequality, which would reflect permanent and transitory component, to consumption inequality. What we know from studies, at least since Franco Modigliani in the 1950s, who got the Nobel Prize because of his studies on consumption and consumption smoothing, and Milton Friedman and many others, subsequently and most of more recent study that consumption is more stable than income. So consumption does not, uh, if you become unemployed, you sort of do not change uh, sort of food shopping or the types of activity if you can uh, afford it and you perhaps can do it by, you know, drawing down your savings or sometimes by borrowing if you have access to credit markets. So through credit markets and insurance, people can smooth transitory shocks. So many of these shocks are smoothed by the government. So think about unemployment insurance. If you become unemployed, it's not true that your income goes to zero because many countries have some form of welfare program providing unemployment insurance for you know, six months, a year, and sometimes uh, even longer. To smooth, to cope with permanent shocks is much more difficult. In principle, it is possible and it could be insured by the government, but it is much more difficult to cope with permanent shock. So economists and people who study consumption think about consumption as depending mostly on permanent shock. Well, remember, before, income depends on permanent and transitory shock. So that the difference in the consumption of people would mostly reflect the difference in the variance of permanent shocks rather than the variance of transitory shocks. And this implies that the change in inequality, so vice stays for inequality, the change in inequality of consumption is actually less than the change in inequality of income. So this is one possibility to explain the fact that I showed you before that the variance of income is greater than the variance of consumption, or income inequality is greater than consumption inequality, and also that it has increased less. Consumption inequality is it is less than uh, income uh, inequality. Now, so to summarize what I've said so far, change in income inequality reflects both transitory and permanent shocks, while the change in consumption inequality should reflect only permanent shocks. Now the issue becomes, so is this reasonable? For this to be reasonable, we must somehow prove or show that indeed people are able to smooth shocks. So that people response to permanent shocks is different than the response to transitory shock. The consumption reflects mostly permanent shock. And then when some transitory shock occurs, people do not respond much. In my sort of stylized equation before, the response was actually zero. It could be that people respond a little to some transitory shock. In, a, in other words, what is the mechanism of transmission of income inequality to consumption inequality? Why is that? I mean, can we sort of link it? Uh, uh, and how can we, uh, can we link it? So here is, you know, what can happen when you receive an income shock. So think about, for instance, that, you know, your employer tells you, you know, you're out of work. Or think about what would happen if, you know, someone goes to a doctor and the doctor has a diagnosis that the person is permanently disabled. So this would be sort of a more permanent shock. I sort of classify what people can do in two, two broad ways. People can do something exposed or people could do something exempted. So what can you do exposed when you receive an income shock. Well, the first thing you could do is that, you know, my income is lower, so what I can, so suppose this is a negative shock, so, you know, bad news <laughs> happens, so what can you do? You can cut consumption. That's the first possibility. You are unemployed, and you reduce your consumption, so you spend less. But, of course, there are other possibilities. The second possibility is that you keep your consumption constant, roughly constant, you run, you run down assets if you have any assets. Some people don't have them, but some people, actually most people, do have them. Or if you don't have them, you can borrow. So you can go to a bank, 
and you can borrow. Some people can actually do that. Some people can actually uh, are, cannot actually do because they go to a bank and the bank says no, uh, I'm not going to uh, borrow. You know, I'm not going to make you a loan. But in principle, people can do. Then there are social networks, and you can ask friends to help you or the family or charities. Then there is the government insurance channel that in some countries is actually very important. Again, think about the unemployment insurance uh, program, which is uh, so large. In other cases, you know, I'm here I'm just listing migration because, you know, it may happen that the shock is so bad that you decide to, to migrate. So you can respond in several ways. Uh, and it is obvious here that some uh, people, for instance, could respond to shock by working more and so forth. But it's equally important, and this is actually the, going to be the focus of so a couple of slides next, that people can respond to examples. So people can engage in action, can do actions to respond example to income shocks. The first thing that comes to my mind is that some people can actually accumulate what is called a precautionary savings, so savings for emergencies. So if something bad happened, you know, because you have accumulated some precautionary savings, you can actually respond by, you know, keeping consumption the same and then down. Some people actually work more when they have the possibility to work more to provide some precautionary labor if you want for bad times. So think about when a family is perhaps thinking to expand, you know, the family thinks about having children and so forth. So you work harder in anticipation of the fact that you plan to sort of expand your, your family. Another thing that people can do, example, is when they think that, you know, things are going bad, is to defer durable adjustment. This is what we are actually seeing now in some countries in Europe because we are, you know, there is a recession coming, so the first sector that is affected is the car industry. In fact, the car production is actually going down because you can, you know, use the car for a bit more years rather than, you know, adjust it when you plan. And then, of course, you could do some portfolio reallocation, choosing less risky uh, assets, for instance, in response to, to this. Or you can, you know, sign an implicit contract with your employer through which, you know, your salary, you know, is so sort of stable across the cycles. You earn a bit less uh, when, you know, uh, things go well for the firm and you earn a bit more, um, you know, when things uh, don't go so well. Um, so, so there are various ways through which you can ensure, and I'm actually going to cover only this one, but each of these has, you know, large literature, studies, empirical evidence, uh, and so forth. The, the other thing is that we want maybe to connect this response, so I'm going to focus mostly on the consumption response and on the precautionary saving channel, but we want to link also this income inequality channel to policy relevance. And there are several reasons why we should actually care about this. The first thing is that many of the wage fluctuations that we observe when people are fired, when people are uh, you know, uh, promoted or demoted and so forth, uh, are hard to insure uh, formally uh, for a variety for a variety of okay? They can be insured to maybe uh, partially. And then if you think about having some government intervention, say, of this debate on unemployment insurance and poverty alleviation and so forth, you have to think about social, how you design these uh, social insurance designs. So should you have an employment insurer that is short term, help people for six months, or should you also cover a longer term? Uh, this really depends on how we see these shocks. If these shocks are transitory or these shocks are permanent, of course, there is a moral hazard problem associated with it because if you have long term unemployment insurance, then people would search less for a new, for a new job. So it's complicated, but it has to do with this debate. And the second thing, Nowadays, <coughs> it's important to know what is the impact of fiscal packages, fiscal reform, tax uh, reforms, because 
the nature of income changes will actually uh, serve to evaluate, to evaluate these policies. Now, for instance, if you think about that, uh, you know, some shocks are permanent and some shocks are transitory, and that these have different impacts on consumption, transitory shocks don't impact much consumption, permanent shocks do impact them, then there are tax policy implications that are important. For instance, if you do a tax reform, tax reform is something that you do forever. So you change the tax system in a permanent way by a reform, then this is a permanent reform, so this is a permanent change in your income, in the present discounted value of your future resources, so this should have large effects on consumption. But instead, uh, tax stimulus packages that are transitory, for instance, you transfer some money to people today, pay you tax them tomorrow, then this should have some effect, but presumably uh, 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 and this is about welfare considerations, I think I already uh, talked about um, before. So, to sort of wrap up all this discussion, consumption response to income shocks uh, is attenuated, it's not one uh, for one, and the main reason is that credit markets and accumulated saving can be used uh, to, smooth, to smooth shocks. But this was well understood, but something that is now more, you know, being studied a lot is that this consumption response really is not the same for different people. Not only there is a different response for permanent and transitory shock, but say people that have high cash on hand, cash on hand means the resources that people have, income plus the assets that you can liquidate, so for say financial assets, respond less than people who instead have low cash on hand, say people who are poor, and the logic is actually very similar. People who are very poor, when their income goes up, they respond to almost one to one, even if the change in income is transitory, and instead people who have accumulated more assets, well, they can smooth shocks more easily. And then what I will show you now is how, you know, people who study consumption see the so-called consumption function today. The consumption function is what? The consumption function is a relation between your resources, which here I call cash on hand, which is income plus assets, so it's your current resources, which include the income, and also <coughs> your assets, in principle, and your consumption. And you see that this consumption function is not linear. Initially, when you are poor, which means you have very little resources, this function, this relation, is linear. What does it mean? It means that if your resources change, then your consumption changes a lot. It could even change one for one. And the reason is that you don't have assets, you don't have accumulated assets before. But if you are rich and you receive a same income shock, so you become a, say you become unemployed, which would be a negative shock, or you win a prize, which would be a positive shock, then you see up there that the change in consumption is quite small. So for the rich, which are these people here, the so-called marginal propensity to consume, which is the response of consumption to the income shock, is actually quite small. And instead for the poor, the marginal propensity to consume, that is the response of consumption to income, you see, is quite large. That is, people respond in different ways, so there is heterogeneity, and this heterogeneity is driven by different resources. Not only that, but it has been studied, and this is, comes from some simulation and theoretical model, I don't want to go into that, but it's quite intuitive that if people receive a negative shock, you see here goes up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. If people receive negative shock and are poor, so this is the case of someone who is poor, and then he becomes unemployed, how does his, how does his consumption react? Well, his consumption reacts a lot. Because if you are poor and you receive a negative shock, your consumption must go down. You don't have accumulated assets, so you react quite strongly. Instead, if you are poor, 
And if you receive a positive shock, so here the numbers are not going up to 0.8, but only to 0.1, you still have a small response. So there is an asymmetry, not only in terms of heterogeneity according to whether people are poor or rich, but also according to whether you receive a positive shock. And in general, people respond much less when they receive a positive shock than when they receive a, a negative shock. So the, all these are things that one can sort of check with data and one can collect sort of appropriate data to see this. So let me now sort of try to, gosh, let me now try to see how people, so for sure we don't get here, possibly we don't get here. So let me sort of highlight how people have checked uh, or studied, uh, you know, the economic shock, the way uh, the effect of economic shocks on consumption, which is my point uh, three. Um, and let me show you this picture for those of you who are interested in this reaction of consumption to income shock. We are actually here. Anticipated income change means this is a shock. We are talking about a transitory shock and we can then evaluate the response to positive and negative. All this is very important for policy because some policies, you know, have you know, a transitory, you give a bonus to people, say this would be a transitory shock, a tax reform would be a permanent shock, it could be positive, it could be negative sometimes, it could be small, it could be large. All this can lead to different predictions and all this can be checked with data. I will just show you one um, slide in which I explain how we can identify a shock. What is a shock? What I call shock transfer repairment in the data. And there are three ways one can do this. One is pretend, which is a strong assumption, that you know what people know. This is what econometricians do. Econometricians think that they know what people know, and then they run regressions, and they estimate a so-called earnings process. And you have to sort of think that you know what is in people's so-called information set. The second possibility is to identify some episodes in which you have income changes unexpected. For instance, this study here is about a bonus that was distributed in Singapore unexpectedly to all citizens. It is Singapore a dividend fund. This has to do with an experiment in which people in Italy receive a certain amount of money and so forth. You know, there are other, other cases. Or you can ask people. You can ask people what they expect to do if you change some income. And this is what I've done with um, my co-author Luigi uh, Pistaferi. I will just show you this picture. This picture is one way or one of the many studies that supports the fact that people have different responses, the consumption response differently to income. Here are people that are poor, and then the question that I ask in a survey is imagine you unexpectedly receive a reimbursement, a bonus, equal to one month income, what would you do? How much would you spend? How much would you save? Well, people who are poor say they would spend all of it, or most of it, and people who are rich, who are around here, they will spend a very little of it. So this is in agreement with some stories I told you before about the fact that the NPC, the marginal policy consume is heterogeneous, which also implies that if you give some money to the poor, taking this money from the rich, so you sort of a Robin Hood type of policy, and you keep your government fiscal balance the same, that is, you take out one euro from this person and you give one euro to this other person, while, you know, for many years, you know, people have claimed that this would not have an impact on aggregate consumption, which, you know, means that the consumption function is linear, if you remember that graph before. Well, here are the so-called redistributive uh, effects. Because I don't have much time, I would just skip some of this because I want to mention now 
in maybe four or five minutes that what I told you about the fact that consumption reacts to income but not one uh, for one, that there is evidence that consumption inequality has increased less than income inequality, has now in the past, I would say, four or five years, and perhaps even more today, been challenged with some evidence from the US, but we don't have similar data for Europe, which if you are, some of you are PhD students, I would regard this as an interesting avenue for research, then uh, um, what has been found is that consumption inequality in the US the past 30 years or so has increased by nearly the same amount as income inequality. So this challenges what I told you so far, that in fact income inequality has increased more than consumption inequality. And people are actually asking now, this would imply that one could measure differences in well-being either with income or with consumption inequality, reaching similar conclusions. So it seems that everything I told you so far is sort of being challenged or not true to some extent, and this is the narrative how it evolved over the years. This was you know, based on a study about 20 years ago for the US, increasing consumption inequality, but not much. Then there was another study showing, you know, using different data. In the US, like in Europe, there is diary data to record consumption expenditure, but there are also interviews. And depending on which data you use, you reach, the, you reach different conclusions, so you see that here you have higher consumption inequality and training more, and here you have even more. So over the years, it seems that according to the data you use, you know, you have increasing consumption inequality. And some of the data that have been used are, you know, new data. And the new data that people are using for consumption and to measure perhaps more accurately consumption inequality, I have listed here some of the data. Some data are supposed to come data, the type of data you see in supermarket, the Nielsen home scan is the more you know, famous uh, one. Then there are some countries, for instance, uh, the Nordic countries, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway. These countries have very good administrative records on income and wealth. And they don't have, of course, administrative data on consumption because they collect this data for tax purposes. But many people have tried to estimate consumption indirectly by because income can be divided into consumption and the change in asset, which is saving, then it must be true that consumption is equal to income minus the change in asset. So from the administrative data on income and wealth, you can reconstruct consumption and therefore you can track consumption inequality. Then there are credit card proprietary data, also in Europe, and then there are so-called financial aggregator websites. There are some apps, and by these apps you can actually aggregate your credit cards, your bank account, your financial accounts, and so forth, so that you get, you get a broad picture of each person's financial transactions on your iPhone or on your phone. So, all these things, what's the benefit of this? Well, there are no issues with recalling expenditures, because you use administrative data, yeah. but representative may be tricky. Not everyone uses internet, for instance. Not everyone does all the shopping in the supermarket and you and so forth. So there are issues with this, but uh, perhaps an avenue that some people are trying to follow is that to combine these traditional survey methods with novel ways to collect uh, information. In principle, if this financial aggregators that some people are using um, work, well, then uh, people who run surveys, they don't have to spend so much time in asking about spending on small items, chewing gum and other small things, and they can ask people more, some more interesting questions, their subjective expectations, their social network, and so forth, because you can free up survey time. But you know, maybe pretty hard to get there because of interpretation. Some people are not willing to report this information. So what I'm saying is that to understand better the dynamics of consumption inequality, people are actually searching for more data, but, you know, we are not right there with 
there is not like a well-established data set that everybody believes is the best one. And then there is also research on inequality in consumption components. And, you know, I want to mention at least uh, some of this. Uh, one uh, big problem is that we face in survey data is that we typically observe um, uh, spending, but we don't observe consumption. So, for instance, we know if someone has bought a car this particular year, but we don't know what is the consumption of the car, which is the flow of services provided uh, by the car. And this can matter for the distribution of consumption and inequality as well. So this is a picture taken from a recent paper by Horacio Attanasio and David Vistaferri, who are you know, major experts on this topic, showing that for many durables, you know, take for instance washers, cooking durables, refrigerator, and so forth, the ownership has changed over time, but not in the same way for the rich and for the poor. So the ownership of some durables has increased uh, over time differently, and because the service from these durables is not recorded either in income or in consumption, this can actually could actually change our picture of consumption uh, and income inequality. The second effect is that you all know this, that you know the price of some goods has been falling. For instance, clothes, you know, clothes, toys, for instance, for kids. Why? Well, because we are more open from China now than we were before, so the relative price of some goods have been reduced, and it's possible that this affects uh, low-skilled workers in some sectors, but the price of goods exposed to competition have declined. So there are concentrated losses from this opening of markets because workers in the sector are exposed to competition, uh, you know, but there are some diffuse gain and on balance it would also be interesting to understand how this impacts the different prices and the different goods on consumption inequality. Finally, I want to mention uh, a third item, which I think is interesting, actually suggests to Conchita that in the future you should have some inequality of food or inequality, uh, some expert on, on this topic, because this is actually quite important also for health economists and so forth. There is evidence, I don't have time to show you here, that inequality in food spending has increased, particularly at the top. So, which means that the rich are spending uh, much more than they used to be in sort of fancy shop with bio food, wines, and so forth, relative to the poor. Okay, so this is a fact. I don't want to show you uh, pictures. But this does not indicate a decline in caloric intakes. Households may spend less on food without modifying the calorie intake of the food they consume because the price of calories has gone, has gone down a lot. The different qualities of food raise important questions. So if you measure inequality just by measuring inequality in euro consumed, well, you find some differences. But how should we measure inequality, say, in food consumption? Should it be based on monetary costs? So, which means monetary cost is being widening, so the distribution is being widening. Energy content, calories, well, in that case, if you want to look at the dispersion in calories, you would not, you would not find, actually, you would probably find perhaps the opposite, a narrow inequality because of the consumption of the cheeseburgers and other things like that. Should it be helpfulness? I don't really know how this should be defined or some other measure of quality. So this is just to tell you that if we sort of want to get a bit more insights on consumption inequality, one should also try to look at components. And these examples about imports from China, food, and what was the other one, durables, I think is important. So I come to, um, yeah, well, then there are other things as well that can, but, uh, let me uh, skip this and let me sort of summarize quickly what uh, I think, um, um, you know, what are sort of the key points. One is that the marginal progress to consume, the way people respond to income shock, uh, is important for several reasons. When you want to overweight 
effective state tax refunds, redistributive, redistributive policies, monetary policies. Well, some people at the end, you know, at the end of the crisis advocated after quantitative easing, even the use of so-called helicopter money. Mario Draghi should end the Send the check to say every citizen in the uh, euro area, say 1,000. So, what would be the impact? We can make this total claim. What would be the consumption impact of sending a check to all the citizens uh, in, in Europe? Well, it depends on the major propensity to consume if you are doing this because you want to stimulate aggregate demand. And what I try to argue is that there is no single NPCs and that there are uh, ways sort of to identify um, these shocks. To summarize the evidence so far is that transitory shocks tend to have a large impact on consumption, but much less than one for one. So it's not zero as in my sort of equation, so-called, you know, the beginning, uh, but it's not one, and it's much less than one. It's much closer to zero. And this is the main reason why consumption inequality is less than income inequality, according to the Sort of traditional explanation. Response is larger for negative income shocks and for relatively small positive shocks. The NPC, and this is the most important dimension of heterogeneity, is larger for low income implications of this. Fiscal and monetary policies have heterogeneous consumption effects. This is something that policymakers not always take into account. For instance, when Mario Draghi and the ACP does monetary policy, you know, usually the impact on GDP, so some aggregate impact, and usually the government and the fiscal policy in the official documents, these, you know, distribution effects are not taken into account. Research with new consumption data finds that consumption inequality tracks more closely income inequality, which opens avenues um, for, future, uh, for future research. And in the end, yeah, uh, people who are involved in data collection are doing an important job because the measurement of income and the measurement of <coughs> consumption is still, you know, a, an open field. So thank you very much, and for, uh, you know, those of you who want more, you know, there is a book on consumption I wrote with uh, which is available with at Stanford who would have more of the theoretical side and also more on the review uh, uh, of the evidence we know so far.